I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. At Wednesday's House Budget Committee hearing, former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich decried Democrats for inflation. Under questioning from conservative Missouri Representative Jason Smith, Gingrich accused liberals of being unable to learn from the past. He also alleged, quote, breathtaking levels of corruption committed in federal spending. Take a listen to Gingrich and Smith's full interchange. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, these questions are for Speaker Speaker Gingrich. Inflation is is up 13.8% since Biden took office. Real wages are down 5.1%. The economy shrank by 1.6% last quarter, and economists are predicting a recession. The Federal Reserve has raised interest rates at the fastest pace in 40 years to combat Biden's inflation crisis. The rate on a 30-year mortgage has doubled since Biden became president, and we expect the Fed will raise rates again at the end of this month. How is the current economy and Democrats' failure to address it affecting American families? You know, th thank you, first of all, both for the invitation to be here and for uh, that, I think, very important question. I think the thing which most surprises me, and as all of you know, I've been around a long time and have been involved in this process of self-government uh, going back uh, to the 1970s. And uh, as a Georgian, I had watched Jimmy Carter as governor, and then I worked with him when uh, he was president and I finally became congressman. What amazes me is the inability of some people, mostly on the left, to learn any lessons of history. Now, maybe that's because I'm a historian, but we know what causes inflation. Uh, inflation is too much paper money chasing too few goods and services. We've been down this road before. The Carter years were a nightmare. We also know, by the way, what that does to families, what it does to children. Uh, it, it's one of the most deadly things that can happen because when, you, when the Federal Reserve tries to stop with inflation using a demand side approach, which is punishing people by cutting demand, uh, you end up in a recession. So now you have families who don't have a job are using up all their savings. As, as one woman said, she couldn't afford to pay for the gasoline to go to the four or five stores to find the infant formula. Now, that's sort of a multiple whammy. And I think your point is exactly right. The budget committee should be looking at how to control spending. It should be looking at how to get it. The, the level of corruption in federal government spending is so breathtaking that it would fund every single dream that the left has if they just could get rid of the corruption. Uh, and yet there are no serious efforts to do that. At the same time, you have to set priorities. When, when we worked with President Clinton, and it was a bipartisan effort. He and I met, I think, for 35 days, hammering out uh, a real balanced budget, the only four real balanced budgets in your lifetime. We understood we had to make tough choices, but there's a simple, here's a simple formula. You either force the American family to make tough choices because their politicians don't have the guts to solve problems, or you make the government have tough choices to liberate the American family. I think you're exactly on target. I can't imagine a dumber moment to increase federal spending than in the middle of an inflationary crisis. Mr. Speaker, to follow on that, the, the Build Back Better bill uh, that sits over in the Senate right now was greenlit by Democrats on, on this committee. It spent over $5 trillion and would have increased taxes by $1.5 trillion, and it would have added $3 trillion to the debt. And while, while the Democrats continue to try and bring this bill back from the dead, uh, where would the country and the economy 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 be right now had Democrats succeeded in enacting that additional level of $5 trillion in spending? Well, let me go back to this idea that it's so hard to get some people to learn anything. Uh, we were at 1.4% inflation at the end of the Trump administration. We were at a dramatically lower price of gas, and in fact, a lower price than President Obama had said was possible. Uh, we were energy independent. But these things weren't accidents. Uh, we were also locking up criminals and we were controlling the southern border. None of these things were accidents. So, so to your point, I've, I've always said that build back poorer would be a much more accurate title for that bill. 
because what it's going to do is it's going to lower the net take home pay of individuals. And by the way, one of the groups, this is a hearing about children, but one of the groups that's really being hammered by inflation are senior citizens. If you're on a fixed income and you're going to get, say, a four or five percent cost of living increase, but the real cost of living, as you pointed out, has gone up over 13 percent while Biden was president, you are losing ground. If you also are in the middle of a declining stock market, you're watching your 401k shrink at the very time that you need it because you can't afford the inflation. You can't, in a lot of cases, people can't afford to buy the necessities. And I think we, we really undervalue how big a threat inflation is to every single working American and every retired American. And that's one of the things that your committee should be really heavily focused on. You know, during your speakership, Congress enacted welfare reforms that encouraged adults receiving assistance to seek or find gainful employment. Uh, similarly, the 1997 Taxpayer Relief Act established a child tax credit. In the American Rescue Plan Act, Democrats dismantled the child tax credit. They removed work requirements and turned the credit into a monthly stipend. As a consequence, the labor force recovered just 1.6 million workers in 2021. After the Democrat child tax credit plan went away, 1.7 million Americans returned to the labor force in just the first two months, just the first two months of 2022. What does the success of efforts you helped initiate, as well as the fallout from policies our Democrat colleagues initiated, tell us about what sort of policies are and are not successful in helping families? And, and why, when enacting these sorts of family supports, did you tie them to income and work? You know, Art Laffer, the great economist who helped develop supply-side economics, always said, you get more of what you pay for and you get less of what you tax. So if you really wanna give people money to do nothing, a lot of people will learn to do nothing. If you really wanna tax people because they go to work, a lot of people will learn not to go to work. Uh, and again, this, these are simple lessons of historic fact. Uh, it is a fact that if you have, and I think you should go through the entire federal program and every place where somebody gets money, they should work for it. Uh, there, there's no reason why people who are able-bodied uh, should be indolent and should be handed a check to do nothing or given food stamps to do nothing. Uh, and I think it's very important to reestablish a work ethic. When we worked on the welfare reform bill, and again, it was a bipartisan program. President Clinton signed it. Uh, and I think people forget that the Clinton-Gingrich reforms, all, every single one of them was bipartisan. It had to be. You had a Republican Congress, a Democratic president. And when we worked on it, uh, we were very close to the governors, particularly Governor Thompson in Wisconsin and Governor um, Engler in Michigan, Governor Allen in Virginia. They had been experimenting on limited approvals with getting people to go back to work. And what we did is we, we looked at a firm called America Works, which is a remarkable firm in New York City, actually created by Mario Cuomo when he was governor. And America Works had a program of helping hardcore unemployed learn the basics. How do you get up in the morning? How do you get dressed? How do you get to the bus stop? Uh, all these things that you, people don't automatically know. Well, we took the lessons of America Works and we applied it to every welfare office in America became an employment office. And people followed the, the, the incentives. You would, you would have a shocking improvement in the economy and a shocking improvement in small business almost overnight by simply requiring that people had to work to get resources from the federal government. It would be that almost instantaneous turnaround. Mr. Speaker, our Democrat colleagues, they argue their child tax credit plan cut child poverty in half. Um, yet researchers at the University of, of Chicago and the University of Notre Dame have determined that child poverty, in fact, declined by just 9% from its peak. Uh, but in October 2021 to December 2021, further, the average child poverty rate since the expiration of the monthly child tax credit payments is lower than the average child poverty rate while the monthly payments were in place. 
So based on, based on your time and work on welfare reform, what do you think is the best way for government to address child poverty? Well, I think first of all, to re rebond the family, to help the, the mother and father get jobs, to take out all of the anti-family provisions that are in welfare, uh, and to take out the anti-work provisions. Uh, the key is to find a way for people to rise so they never go off a cliff of losing so many government subsidies that it's not worth their while to go to work. If you do that, if people, and the reason, I'll just close with this. The reason it matters to get people to go to work is in the long run. You want every child to learn that work is legitimate, it's authentic, and it's a key part of their life if they're going to rise and have a better future. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen's time is expired.